every single morning. Every single morning. <clears throat> every single morning he comes back to the pier. He likes the north side, but if the south's good, he'll ride there. He's not a socializer. He's an actualizer. Compulsion, distinction, innovation, what it means to live, what it means to be a surfer, to do, to create. He mixes his media, he recombines, he invents, he innovates, challenges, provokes. He responds. It's not about creating a new culture or being a slave to an old one. It's about doing it your own way, making it different, changing it, advancing it, higher, faster, tighter. There are no arenas in surfing, no finish lines, no boundaries. In this kind of world, you don't think of yourself as being an athlete, but it doesn't mean you're not one. You paddle out in the middle of the ocean and you test yourself in ways most people can't conceive. You learn a lot of lessons. Some of them you can bring back on the land. Other ones, you can't even speak of them. That's what keeps him going. That's what keeps him coming back every single morning. Hello, thanks for the warm welcome. Um, you know, empowering that kid that was featured in there uh, is really, really what we're trying to do and why we exist. It's about uh, enabling, empowering, giving a voice to that generation, and it's a, it's a huge passion of ours. So, so if you'll indulge me, I'd just like to share a couple of stories on how we got there, because we didn't always feel that way. Um, here's where I'm from, Huntington Beach, California. They call it Surf City, USA, and uh, it's quite a crossroads for the world of surfing. It's a really big deal, like uh, growing up there and watching and living there um, is where I got my start and my passion. Um, it was quite a rough and tumble zone back in the day, and uh, you didn't really go there unless you were invited, like within 100 yards each side of the pier. It was kind of a weird, like exclusive club. This is me. I used to uh, try to shape surfboards for a living and uh, actually made a career out of it. It was, it was really fun for me. You know, when the town was just bustling and going off, probably in town out of the 10 shops every week, 400 surfboards would be sold. And really famous shapers would go there. And a shaper is a guy that like sculpts the surfboard. Uh, a lot of times when the famous shapers uh, were in demand, they didn't really have time to finish their work, if you know what I mean. Um, the nightlife was pretty big at the time. Uh, we had a young baby, and, and we didn't choose this as my lifestyle. We chose this as my career. So, so shaping boards was really fun. I had zero natural ability at it, which was kind of ironic because... Yeah, no joke. I mean, I'm not trying to be humble or anything. I just had no skill, and <laughs> it didn't stop me. You know, I just wouldn't give up. And so what I did was they call it ghost shaping. So, you know, Joe, famous shaper, would get all these orders, and, you know, he'd scratch his head and go, man, I don't want to do all this work. Who could I get to do it? Oh, yeah, Hurley will do it. So that's what I did without my name on the boards and everything, and I was pretty reliable. So a lot of work came my way because I got it done on time, and you know, through the sheer act of repetition, um, I got adept at it. I wouldn't say I was good. I got adept at it. And, uh, and the irony is that having no skill um, led to a small ego regarding surfboard design. And so what I was able to do was listen to the athlete in a, in a way that I hadn't strategized to. It was, it was like my only avenue for success. So like, hey, athlete, what do you think? What should I do? What can we do together? 
And um, it's kind of like being a chef. I would take all these ingredients. Surfboards are all about compromises. You know, round edges grab the water. Sharp edges release the water. Concaves release the water. V bottoms grab the water. And you make all these trade-offs for different styles in an athlete. And um, it got to where I was actually pretty in demand around town, like with all the good surfers. And, and they started uh, asking me to make boards. And this is a shot, this is probably like 1978. I had a good friend in town that bought this surf shop and um, it's now the best surf shop in Huntington, but at the time it was just starting. And he said, hey Bob, I notice everybody's riding your boards around town. And I'm like, oh, thanks man, that's cool. I, I appreciate you noticing, because uh, I was kind of anonymous. And he said, what I'd like to do for my new store is I'd like to buy eight surfboards from you. And I'm like, oh. Thank you so much, but I don't even know how to do that because I didn't have a logo for the boards. You know, it wasn't called Hurley yet, and I definitely didn't have any money. Like, we never had a penny, and so I couldn't afford to buy the materials. And I said, I said Aaron, that's a huge compliment. I'm honored, but I, I really can't do it for you for those reasons. And he goes, well, how about, how about I just write you a check for the boards right now, and then when you can, you deliver them. And I thought, really? You're just going to do that for me? I, <laughs> Are you crazy? And, uh, and so that, that taught me a good lesson right there about believing in folks. But he wrote me a check. He said, how much are they? <laughs> I said, well, I already told you, I don't really sell boards. And uh, he goes, how about $300 a board? And I said, that seems like way too much since all the other top boards are wholesaling for 200. He goes, yeah, but I want the best you can do. I want them to be magic. I want them to look pretty. And you can just make me whatever you want. And I'm like, okay. So he wrote me a check for 2,400. We got that done. And then, I, I mean, I, I was literally blown away. And uh, then I met this guy. And uh, <laughs> obviously, this guy has some attitude. And he was, a, he was a former world champ, very, very predominant. And at the time I met him, he actually was world champ. Um, his name is Rabbit Bartholomew. And like I mentioned, surfing at Huntington Pier, like Huntington's different than Newport Beach. At Huntington, if you stepped out of line, you would get punched. In Newport Beach, if you step out of line, everyone would be nice to your face and then talk behind your back. <laughs> so, I mean, it was kind of like a big deal. And I was, I was on the fringes of this tough guy crowd. I was never a tough guy or a good surfer, but I was on the fringes and I was in. And so I saw this guy uh, way in by shore surfing and I, I, I geeked out and I went over and I'm like, oh my gosh, are you, are you, are you him? You know, and he's like, oh yeah, mate, I'm Rabbit, nice to meet you. And I said, hey, you know, you're, I, yeah, I know the reputation, but you're more than welcome to, you know, come out there and surf with us guys, you know. <laughs> We're hooking him up, you know. And he, and he, he said something that really changed, uh, it changed the course of my business career. And he said, uh, you know, I appreciate that. It's super kind of you. And he was gracious as could be. He goes, but where I get my energy is right here with these kids, man. It's so fun, and I get so inspired. And uh, I'm going to not take you up on that offer, but thank you very much. And wow, what a big lesson that was for me, like really listening to the kids and getting inspired. I mean, we were so into old school hierarchy, the good old boy system, the tough guy system, keep out the new people, all that stuff. It was just kind of embarrassing, but he taught me something pretty good there. And, you know, here, here, here's sort of the outcome, having a huge passion and a huge desire to serve these kids. And, uh, you know, we ended up with a slogan, which isn't just a slogan, it's a true desire of our hearts to be a microphone for youth, because a lot of people gave us a break, and uh, man, you know, you've heard some of the presentations today, I mean, these people are amazing, you know, young kids, they can do anything. This image right here, we, we had this company, I kind of skipped ahead, sorry about that. But anyways, <laughs> I'm not, I, you probably noticed already, I'm not a professional speaker. <laughs> sorry, uh, but uh, there's better ones coming. There, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so while I was making boards, Hurley Surfboards was pretty successful. Me and a guy named Sean Stussy, you may have heard of Stussy Clothing, we were like the most in-demand guys. Um, through our connections with pro surfers, we found out about a company called Billabong. And Billabong was an uh, Australian company. We obtained the U.S. license, and it turned into a clothing business. I couldn't believe it. It actually turned into like a legit business. So 
So we had this idea, you know, based on some of Rabbit's comments and based on experiences, uh, we had this new idea, which was new at the time, we thought, in 1999, of inclusion. We, we didn't want people to think they were cool or we were cool just because we surfed. You know, we thought the coolest thing was positivity and life and trying to do something and make something and including people. So we, uh, we actually gave the Billabong brand back. Uh, we didn't have to. It was a $100 million business at the time, very profitable, and we just had to follow our hearts. And it would really, you know, that, that sounds kind of crazy, but it really was a no-brainer. You know, most of you probably know in your life there's just things you have to do. We were compelled. So, so we launched this brand called Hurley, which... Uh, it, Hurley was based on innovation, which is, which is why kind of like Michael Jordan's up here. And Hurley was very successful the first few years in business, like ridiculous. Their tra trajectory was like this. So we gave back a $100 million business. Next year, we had Hurley, which was totally new, differentiated, based on innovation, inclusion, inspiration. We went uh, year one, $28 million. Year two, 45. Year three, 75. Very profitable, amazing. Well, then we needed some capital. And I don't know if you guys have run businesses or tried to borrow money, but it's not so easy. And, uh, and you know, we were growing so fast. My CFO said, hey, you're probably going to have to borrow $100 million in the next two years. And I was like, yikes. You know, no assets, no whatever. You know, I didn't want to do that. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, you know, P Brain says, why don't we get a great partner? who's the best company out there? And I was like, oh, Nike. What? Nike needs us, you know, my arrogant. <laughs> they really, really need us. Well, they didn't need us. But anyways, I met a guy there named Tom Clark who used to run Nike for 10 years. And he was so great and gracious. And, uh, and he said, uh, hey, man, I love this idea. Microphone for youth, connecting all the kids on the planet is awesome. Just so you know, Nike's not buying companies right now, but really good to meet you. And I love the idea. And maybe in a couple years, if we're in that mode, we should talk again. And I said, well, I can't wait a couple years. This thing's going like this and I, I got to get a great partner. And, you know, I wish it was you guys, but that's fine. You know, maybe you never know what happens. He said right then and there, oh, okay, cancel the last statement. You got to come meet Phil Knight. And so, <laughs> so I went and met Phil on um, September 10th, 2001. And we had a funny meeting. It was horribly awkward because I was not prepared. I thought Tom was going to present. There was no sales pitch going on. Tom looked at me and I was like, me? Oh, God, Mr. Knight. Oh, my God. Well, I got surfing. Like, really super cool. Yeah, it was, it was bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so Phil said... Uh, gee, can we go through your PowerPoint? You seem really nervous. And I said, I don't even know what that is, let alone have one. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, this will be the best meeting of my day. So we had a nice chat. Uh, the next day, as you know, was September 11, 2001, the horrible day. And then on September 12, Tom called me up at 8.15 in the morning. For two minutes, we talked about the tragedies of the day before, and we commiserated. And then he said, well, do you want to do business or not? And I'm thinking, yes, of course I want to do business. September 12, 2001, come on, let's get started. Let's just do it. So anyways, uh, <laughs> I didn't say that on the phone, but I am that corny. Uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, nowadays, what we're really focused on is bringing new innovations to market, inspiring athletes. You know, Nike has a thing. If you have a body, you're an athlete. And we like to bring inspiration to everyone. So... We, we, we brought this board short. It's called the Phantom Board Short. We've, won pat, we've got a patent on it. We've won like six times board short of the year. It's changed the whole industry, and it's leveraging Nike technology. And we always thought surfing was a sport worthy of a company like Nike. And so we're the, we're the surf division of Nike. And we're able to change the game. We have game-changing athletes. There's stuff going on in surfing that's never been seen or done before, and we're happy to be a willing participant in, in that process. And, and we're just super, super thankful and thrilled every day. And really, it boils down to this burning desire to be part of what the kids are doing. And, um, you know, the world keeps changing so rapidly, and we just want to be part of the future, not the past. So, so that's, that's kind of our story. I, uh, you know, I, I don't like. I guess the big idea would be inclusion and the complete energy it brings. You know, if this whole auditorium was filled with 16-year-olds, which I know there's a bunch in here, and we said, "Hey, guys, we can do anything. We will fund you. Like, let's do crazy stuff." 
I know crazy stuff would happen. And, and that's what we believe. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's our story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>